right. Coming at you all the way live. It's sound waves. Coming from the lower bottoms of West Oakland. I am blessed enough to have the vice presidential running mate of Howie Hawkins for the Green Party, Angela Walker. <laughs> so one thing I want to do with this show, there's going to be some changes going on with this show in the in the coming future. And I want people to understand this show has been a great way for me to help cats understand things that don't get to be that, that aren't talked about in the mainstream political discourse. And one thing we never talk about is third parties. And the Green Party in 2016, when Jill Stein was running with my, I always say his name wrong. Amiru Baraka. Ajamu. Ajamu. See, I said it wrong. And that's probably why he don't return my emails. Ajamu Baraka. Um, that was the first time I heard the term Green New Deal. And they were saying it every, every time you'd see, and it wasn't much, you know, there's only a certain kind of, of, of media that was even covering anything beyond the two-party duopoly. Uh, so maybe Democracy Now! would have them. Maybe, uh, Jesus, maybe the Young Turks, something like that. But all the time, they spoke about the Green New Deal. And I always associated the Green New Deal with the Green Party. Does the party feel a bit slighted that that rhetoric kind of got swooped up by the uh, the Democrats? First, I want to thank you for having me on. Um, I appreciate you. And thank you for being here. Really, I, I appreciate it. And no, I don't. I wouldn't say. I don't think the party feels slighted. I think that we have on the left period. Um, a history of the Democrats and mainstream parties swooping in and co-opting our best ideas, and <laughs> you know diluting them and and then presenting presenting them to the public as if this is something they came up with. I think we're used to that. So it's been a bit of I've gotten a tiny bit of pushback from people who don't know where the original Green New Deal, you know, where it came from. I've gotten some some flack from people who don't know its history, um, mm -hmm. that it originated with us and not, you know, the Democrats. But I don't I wouldn't say that we feel slighted about it. I think that's kind of a common thing that that happens. Is the left divided, in your opinion? <laughs> Good Lord, are we? <laughs> <laughs> Woo boy. I could write a book on that, but no, I mean, we, I mean, it is. And it's like, you know, you, I think because one of the things with this campaign and I think it will be, it's a welcome challenge, but it, it, it is going to be a challenge, especially as acrimonious as this year is with so many mm -hmm. different things happening and people's emotions running high and, you know, a feeling of, insecurity financially insecurity as far as housing people are on the edge and um i think that you know one of our goals is left unity and and doing what we can as a party and i'm also howie and i both are also the nominees for the socialist party of the usa and members of both uh the socialists and the greens and so looking forward and talking about a unipo unified independent left with all of these different currents running is going to be interesting. Um, very interesting, but I, I have, you know, I'm not known for my optimism. I'm a complete <laughs> Eeyore. <laughs> Damn, I'm an Eeyore. It's like, look, give me, I, the glass is always half empty, but we're going to work it out. Um, I'm a Capricorn. I can't help it. But um, 
You know how it go. But what I've said and what I stand on is finding the intersections between, you know, where do we all on the left, what do we, what do we agree on? Where can we meet up? Where can we build from? You know, we don't have to, and we're not going to all, you know, hold hands and sing Kumbaya and be best buddies. I would love that, but that is not going to happen. It's not realistic. But in getting work done in our communities, where can we, you know, find those intersections and build from those and build our network out that way? That's the thing I'm concentrating on. How do we connect with the working class? I feel like the the socialist movements and the Marxist, Marxist movements are extremely middle class. They're kind of white. Um, Not very white. Don't say it. <laughs> they're pretty white. And even a lot of the shows, even a lot of like the leftist shows that I enjoy are so just entrenched in a lot of theory. It, it can yes. be a little bit overwhelming. So how do we just reconnect with that working class and even reconnect to our black radical past? Because mm. we do have a, a very, very strong black socialist past that oh, goes, yes. Jesus, all the way back to, you know, before the turn of the century and even in the church. Mm -hmm. I think I think one of the things that helps me. Could, and I think with Howie, too, connecting with the working class for us is not difficult because we are working class. Howie is a retired Teamster. I'm still driving a dump truck. That is what I do every day. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, coming from a labor background, I think has been helpful for the both of us in, in knowing how to translate theory to practice and in a way that people understand like it's really and one thing you know i've had conversations with socialists and with you know folks on the left is that you can't spout excuse me you can't spout theory at people they you know and then be you know why don't they get it talk to folks which is you know i describe myself as an asada shakur and fred hampton socialist it's like make mm. it plain talk to people about things that they understand and then they you know things that matter to them. It's great to talk, you know, be able to spout off Marxist theory, but people need to eat. <laughs> so when you're mm -hmm. talking, when you're talking to folks, you know, bring it home to them and it's not dumbing it down. It's just explaining socialist concepts. It's like the idea that you as a worker should be part owner of where you work and your coworkers, all of y'all should own that and have, you know, Y'all are making the decisions for what's produced, making the decisions for how those things are used or like in your home, in your community. Y'all should own your housing. And, you know, our people have always understood cooperation and our people have always understood, you know, pooling resources to take care of all. And I think that that's, you know, you referenced our black radical past, I think that's something that is absolutely coming to bear and absolutely relevant right now. And something that our people during this pandemic, during this uprising and moving through these things, I think those are things we're going to have to rely on, to be honest with you. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. Now let's get to know Angela Walker. You are from <laughs> Mill Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I am. And you have been involved with movements for some time. You actually um you, you went against the Tea Party in 2011, is that right? Well, I was part of the Wisconsin uprising. Um and we I was appointed as a matter of fact i was a, a a milwaukee county transit driver and a member of the amalgamated transit union local 998 and um because of me going to the protests and like finding out things that the coke brothers produced to get people to like boycott and stuff i was passing out boycott sheets at like one of our union meetings and it got the attention of the union president and he was like 
you did this? And he was like, yeah, you know, it's just what you do. And he was like, you know, you should be the legislative director for the union. And I was oh, wow. like, yeah, that's exactly what I said. I was like, seriously? Because the vacancy had just come open. And, you know, I've been an activist pretty much most of my life. So um, it was... It was a, it was a, it was a thing, and it was really helpful to um, be able to get our local involved in Occupy, and also in Occupy the Hood, you know, and decolonize the hood, you know, dealing with our our Latinx family, and mm-hmm. you know, our Black family in Milwaukee, and trying to lift up the issues that the mainstream Occupy movement was not looking at, because as we know, it was predominantly white. And so um, making sure those issues got lifted up. And um, in 2014, I ran as an independent socialist against a then Milwaukee County Sheriff David Clark. And if you know who that is, then you know. (laughs) He's the Fox News guy. That's that guy. He's the yeah. black guy with the cowboy hat, and he always comes out there to uh, defend like super racist narratives against black people. Absolutely, he he referred to black people in Milwaukee as pond scum, basically, or human scum. Mm. Yes, mm. that was our people have died under his watch. So there was also that. Um, yeah, and so I, we, you know, our campaign pulled twenty percent of the vote from him. And um, got the attention of the Socialist Party of the U.S. And in 2016 was my first run for vice president with um, Emilio, known as Mimi Soltisic, who's out there Mm -hmm. in California. And um, that got the attention of Howie Hawkins. I've been on panels with Howie and um, was familiar with him, was, you know, familiar with the Green Platform. So when he asked me about being his running mate it was kind of a it 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 made sense to me i i i rock with the green platform so and what is that green platform well there's a whole lot in it um but i think in a nutshell primarily what people when they think of the green party they think of things that you know no nukes and you know being part of the peace movement um environmental reform big environmental reform and so those things really resonate very deeply with me and being a socialist it just kind of makes sense to link wanting a just and healthy society for human beings while also respecting the life of the planet and the non-human life on this planet and resisting the plundering of this planet's natural resources under capitalism. And so it just makes sense to me. Side note, did you watch Michael Moore's newest movie, Planet of the Humans? I have not seen it yet. I, you're uh, talking to somebody that does not own a television. I just uh, I, it's only on YouTube. Is it? Yeah, there's some there's some some people have some issues with it. I was wondering I if you saw, saw the it. Re- I saw reviews on it and I said like how he said too that um you know we kind of reserve judgment until mm-hmm. we actually watched it, but I've read reviews on it. I don't you know reading the reviews, I don't know how I feel about it, but yeah. Well, do me a favor. I'm going to send you the link to it. Why take some time? I know you are a very busy person. Take some time and just hit me back after you see it. I can do that. Now, I want to get more into your upbringing in Milwaukee. Okay. Um, I have a good friend of mine who actually was on this show about a month or so ago when the big election was happening with the uh, the judges out there, the, the special election. Yes. Is it a month ago, two months ago? Something and he was really in, says beginning of May. He was involved. He actually left here in California to go take a job out there in Milwaukee and has been totally involved with the politics out there and has been involved with the whole Scott Walker mm. g- getting him out yes. for, for a while now. Yes. As as you were, as you were. Um before even all that, there was a case that 
I hate to say it, it's kind of, I don't want to say a joke, but we don't look at it as seriously as I think we should. And, and now we're having all these talks about defunding the police, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And Jeffrey Dahmer, one of the more notorious serial killers of all time, at least in modern history, mm-hmm. is from Milwaukee. And he predominantly had killed uh, black gay men. Yes. And there was one case that there's actually audio from it. The 911 call where there was a little boy. I think he was Laotian or Vietnamese. Yes, he was. And he was a, and he was a boy. Uh, Connor accent, the Samsung. Oh, was and you hear, four, four, is it 14? Like he was, he was small. And you hear, you hear a woman on the phone. She goes, there's a little boy out here. He's running around naked. And I, I think, and he's, he's bleeding from his behind. Yes, he was. And she goes, I, and she goes, I think he needs help. And the cops came and Jeffrey Dahmer kind of shrugged it off as uh, a weird lover spat. The kid had been drugged, so I don't even think he could even speak English at the time. Um, And Jeffrey Dahmer went on to kill so many more people after that. Yes. He killed that young man as soon as the police left. Oh. How did that affect the black community? We don't really talk about that when we think about Jeffrey Dahmer. I think I think because a lot of people want to forget it was so it was rough. I mean, I'm queer and mm-hmm. during that time I was, you know, like a senior in high school getting ready to get out of high school and um all of my friends and I say that because, you know, that was the community and he was praying on you know, the bars, you know, where, where gay people congregated, you know, that there was mm-hmm. like a, it was a couple of them. Um, mm-hmm. And people were so afraid. They were so afraid. And he was, you know, allowed because this community had been so marginalized basically allow free reign to do what he was doing because of who he was preying on. And when the, um, the news about what happened, you know, when it came out about what happened with Connor accent, the sound phone and that the police had him, they had him. All they had to do was take him in. They would have saved mm-hmm. his life. He was very mm-hmm. obviously looking, you know, remembering pictures of him. He was a kid. He didn't look like an adult. He looked like a kid, which is what he was. And because he was Asian and because this white man basically said, you know, we're having a spat. Never mind that this young man is dazed, naked Mm -hmm. and bleeding. They handed him back because the police and I, I, I don't miss don't quote me on this. But I'm if I remember correctly, the police were like they didn't want to be involved. Because it was a, quote, gay lover spat. Well, how is it a spat when this young man is dazed, bleeding, not coherent, and he's naked in public? Why didn't you just take him in? But because they Mm -hmm. didn't want to be bothered, they handed him over to him. And I think this came directly from the trial that Dahmer admitted that as soon as he, um, as soon as the police left, he killed him. I knew people who knew that kid. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Mm. I knew people who knew him. I knew people. I- we all knew where that apartment complex was. Yeah. And what's so hearing your story to me, it it makes a it it changes the narrative because so often and we never really talk about the racial aspects of the way we look at and fawn over serial killers. Here's a guy like Jeffrey Dahmer. There's so many movies, documentaries, specials on his life, on his parents, on his goddamn neighbors. Everybody wants to talk about why, 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 why. And no one wants to look at that aspect of it. That that man was able to prey on a marginalized community because no one really cared about the people in the community. Except their families. And sometimes even mm. then, 
it was, you know how our community can be towards our gay family. Oh you yeah. You know how how that goes sometimes. So Oh yeah. Um there was there was that. Um but I think there was a lot of shock and I remember you know, once he was arrested and once he went to trial, they had to put plexiglass up in the courtroom because the family, they were coming after him. People are like literally leaping across tables trying to get him. So, um, yeah, it was it was wild. And he just sat there. But he he if I recall correctly, he made a statement about why he preferred black and, and Latinx and Asian you know, people of color. He had a preference for them. And, you know, there was also a a, a cannibal aspect to it. My dad, um, there was a chocolate company in Milwaukee, Ambrosia. Smelled magnificent. Um, Mm -hmm. Not there anymore. But my dad worked there for a minute. And he said that when Dahmer would heat his food up in the microwave, no one would want to use it behind him. Oh, oh! I remember that. That's, I remember him saying that 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 it was you know no one would want to come near that microwave after he had used it, and that um you know nobody knew what it was he was eating, and then when it came out, it was just like really, <laughs> really, this really. <laughs> it's like oh. what do you what do you do with that? You you you're like. On lunch with a with a cannibal. I mean, dude, who even does that? And it, and again, it's so crazy because we look at him, and so many people want to get into the oh, well, he killed animals as a child, and he pulled the wings off flies, and it's like, yeah, but he was also allowed yes. to to do this to this young boy. Yes. In front of law enforcement. Yes. Like if if you hear the nine one one call. The woman that makes the call sounds so frightened for this little boy that's wandering around in the street. And for nothing to be done about that, again, that's why we, we, we have that's why we're, we're that's why we're at where we're at yeah. when it comes to law enforcement. Now you are currently in the South, correct? Yes. Is it wild by you or is it a little more tame? As far as far as far as the as far as the uprisings, very quiet. Gotcha. Very quiet. Florence is not a big municipality, Um, and they have had. I think there have been actions here, but I don't know who's organizing on the ground here. Um, I'm not a native, and um, it's hard to kind of figure out where to plug in. I know in cities like Columbia and like Charleston, they they were tearing stuff up. So <laughs> they was like, look, no, um, but Florence, look, look, Florence is, <laughs> look, Florence <Y'all> okay. is quiet. <laughs> <It's> quiet. <laughs> now, were you in South Carolina when the Dylan roof thing, roof thing went down? No, I was not, but I did. Um, I was in Savannah shortly after not that. Far. To do, yeah, exactly. Not far from there. Yeah, exactly. And some of the, I was there to, to help train educators to be organizers for their union. Mm-hmm. And um, some of the, in fact, the contingent that I, of, of educators that I was working with, ha- they had ties to that church and to the folks lost in that church. Mm. Uh, yeah. That was and it's just, that's another situation with the police. It's like, you you take him to Burger King. <laughs> you you duck his head, you know, push his head down so he doesn't bang it. This man, this young person, made the statement that I almost didn't do it because they were so nice to me. But you still looked in the face of those people and you pulled the trigger, and it didn't mean anything to you. And the police are kind to you. Mm-hmm. Brianna Taylor was in her bed, not bothering anybody. Mm-hmm. it's just and I do I get I'm I'm frustrated when I think about that that this this pain that 
that this person could look at these people at prayer who invited him in and you could still slaughter them. We have a problem in this country. We have a problem. And it is deeper people want to point at guns. We have a violence problem that is at the heart of everything we are seeing right now. Everything. This country was conceived in violence. And it has thrived on violence. And this is where we are. And, you know, I don't mean to tear up. It's just, it's a lot. No. No, it is. It is a lot. It is, it is a lot. And it hits you in a certain place because you see it over and over again in our community. You see the over policing of these poor areas. You see the the making of homelessness through over policing. Right. Yeah. I'm poor. I live on the margins. Oh, damn. I just got arrested. Now I'm losing some, my job. I lost my benefits. Oh, no, I lost my housing. And I got so many up. people. Yeah, I got people on my block right now. If they're not living in, well, they, they took the tents out over here. So it's just people living in cars. So there's multiple rows of people living in cars. So it's not just cars parked along the street. It's rows of cars parked along a street. And I'm, you know, it's just how do you how do you do this to people? You know, I'm thinking of the the excesses of the Milwaukee Police Department. I mean, mm -hmm. a few years ago, a young man named Dontre Hamilton was shot 16 mm -hmm. times for sleeping in a public park. He didn't do any that. just like this situation with uh Rayshard Brooks at Wendy's. The exact same situation. He was asleep. What did you shoot him for? And he you know, this young man, you know, a couple of days ago, Rayshard Brooks you shot, they shot him in the back. How was he a threat? Mm -hmm. Don Trey mm -hmm. was asleep and unarmed. How was he a threat? And I think that's the question our community keeps asking over and over and over again. How are they a threat? They weren't armed. How are you afraid for your life? And so when we're talking about defunding the police, we are talking about taking the, that money from over bloated police budgets and reallocating it in a way that gets police to not be doing the stuff they're doing. You know, someone mm -hmm. like Don Trey Hamilton may have needed like a counselor or somebody sent out there, somebody unarmed that is trained to deal with unexpected situations with people. Because Don Trey was need he wasn't, as the, the police tried to characterize him before, he wasn't houseless. He wasn't unhoused. He was, you know, he he had work and he was just tired and he laid down. That was it. But you you don't sin like with Rayshard Brooks, like someone on Twitter made the point today. You know, if we had counselors, they should have sent, what did they, the tweet was divesting from police means sending a tow truck and a counselor to Rayshard Brooks instead of armed police. That's that's the difference. So when people, because there's a lot of questions that people have around, you know, what does it mean to defund? This is what we're talking about. Reallocation of those funds from bloated police budgets. And and that's another thing I don't think people really understand because now I, the, the narrative I think is going to be when the defund the police argument comes up on Fox News, it's going to be the, the comeback is going to be um, what if someone's breaking in my house? And to me, the answer is always police are reactive. They will never stop the break in. The break in will happen. They will come there and take a statement from you. Maybe they catch the person. Most likely they won't, depending on where you live, but they will not stop the break in. Go ask police officers. They are not intervening on crimes that are happening in real time. They're always cleaning up the mess. Exactly. I had a situation where I work. I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. I'm sorry. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Go no, ahead. No. Finish your thought. Uh, I, I work in one of the emergency shelters in Oakland. I don't okay. know if you know, I, I say it as much as I can on this show. Um, and I work and a lot of the problems we have are issues with mentally ill. Mm -hmm. um, if 
cats think just because you put people in a house, everything is fine. It's not fine because you can't erase years of being unhoused, years of drug abuse, years of trauma. You can't erase that with a roof. A roof helps. I am pro everybody having a roof. I'm pro everybody having clean water. I'm pro everybody having all those wonderful things. But I, but I also want people to understand it is part of it. Public health and mental health is, is something that we don't talk about enough. Yes. And a lot of these issues that you have are like public health, mental health issues, and the police are responding to it with a gun. And a lot of shootings that you see are mental health issues that you can talk those people down and they're not armed. They may have knives. They may have some sort of weapon. I mean, this is every day for me. Every day I go to work, I'm going to have to talk somebody down. Mm. I'm going to have to calm a situation down without the use of mace, a baton or a firearm. Mm. And I'm just a dude, a junior college dropout. I don't hit him over the top with crazy Freudian psychological terms. I listen (laughs) and I try my best to deescalate. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. But one thing we do know is it's got to be an extreme situation for us to need to call law enforcement. And see, that's the thing. And that's, you know, there was a situation in Madison, Wisconsin with a young man uh, a few a couple years ago, I want to say 2015, mm-hmm. Tony Robinson. He was having, I think it might have either been mental health or a substance use situation. He just needed de-escalation. He, he was freaking out. That's all. He wasn't hurting anyone. And his, you know, the folks in the house with him didn't know how to help him and did the only thing that they knew to do. And they called the, the police, police who murdered him in his hallway mm. as a kid. I want to, I want to mm. say he was very early twenties. He was just a kid. Mm. <laughs> and it's, they, they, it, yeah, it's like They're coming there with a the gun, you know, exactly. And, and also there, it's not just having the weapon It's seeing somebody of color. He was mixed. Mm. He was mixed. And so you're already coming with a certain mindset. You know, thinking about Natasha Richardson, who had a mental health, was having a mental health crisis and was tased and and stripped and murdered by the police. And it's just like, that's not what we need. And Mm -hmm. I think at this moment we are charging the country with being tone deaf with what we've always been asking for, which are wraparound services. One of the things that the, the, the platform I ran on in 2014 as sheriff is that if you want to end crime, then end poverty, address the systemic racism that got us to this point and dismantle this, give people the services that they need. Stop taking access you know, for medical access, for transit, access for education, access for clean and decent housing, access for all of the things that people need. When you strip people of the things that enable to enable them to simply live their life in this country, what do you expect? This is what we get. And then there's no, no net for people who are caught up in mental health, you know, having mental health crises or having substance use crises and those things that infrastructure is not in place. And so now you kill people because you don't know how to handle them because we don't have anything else in place for that. And because you're also coming to this, this scene where something is happening with it already in your head, because that is the culture of the police that you're going to, you know, you're going to subdue. You're going to handle it. And oh, well. And when it's a person of color, you can do this with impunity because who's going to charge you for it? Mm -hmm. 
is mm -hmm. we reform is not what we are asking for. We are asking to dismantle this system. We are asking to rebuild it. In fact, we are not asking, we are demanding. And people have been in both Howie's, you know, feed and my feed. Defund is a little too strong. No, it's not. No, it is not. It is a time to speak and, and demand exactly what it is we're asking for. Defund is exactly what they're saying. Take that money out of those police budgets and let's start reallocating funds for wraparound services that people need and empowering the community to address its own problems. Instead of calling in people who most often live outside those communities and come into communities with certain ideas about the people who live there ready to beat their heads in. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah, that's definitely it. Yeah. And, and they tell the cops, you can't live in this area because if you arrest somebody in the area and then you go out to dinner with your family, they may see you and they may get you. Therefore, you should never live in the area you police in. So it's almost like if you're going to fuck these people up, don't live near them because they may try to fuck you up back. Which and I that, think it that, feeds into it. I mean, because you the don't live there and you don't know them. Isn't that the antithesis of protect and serve? I would think so. I mean, don't we want our mayor to live in our city? Don't we want the governor to live in our state? Don't we want the president to live in this country? <laughs> but we don't want law enforcement to live in the city that they patrol. Or the neighborhoods that they're being assigned to. And if they do live in the neighborhood, it's a special program and there's a special house with a special cop that lives there for a special amount of time. It's not integrated into the fabric of that community. They don't see themselves as a part of the community. I literally watched. There used to be a residency requirement for police in Milwaukee County. I literally watched at a budget hearing a few years ago. The police union bully our mayor to get out of that residency requirement, like physically bully him. It was frightening. There's a there's a documentary on Netflix called uh, L.A. 92, and it just takes footage from the riots and before and news archival footage. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. to tell the story of what happened with Rodney King, also with Latasha Harlins and then the riots and after. And they show some of the hearings before the riots with Daryl Gates and the city council. And he does a lot of bully or did a lot of bullying with city council, old school police, mm -hmm. Daryl Gates. And, and, uh, We've been talking a lot on a lot of the episodes about 92, because I think 92, I think to this day, it's still the most devastating um, of these uprisings we've ever seen as far as like a financial cost. Like in 1992 dollars, it was a billion dollars in damage. I remember and, when that jumped off. Oh, I and remember. Like, whoa, what? <laughs> whoa. And it just, and it didn't stop. No. And it the, did the, not stop. But the painful thing is after all of these, you know, the, this litany of names of Black dead that we have, mm -hmm. it hasn't stopped. Mm -mm. It hasn't stopped. I think, you know, the thing that sets the character of this uprising, and I've heard other people say this, that sets the character of this particular uprising a sets it apart is the fact that these young people are not willing to be pacified. They, they are, they are spotting these pacification techniques two miles away and they are shutting that shit down before it gets to them. Like that, that, you know, the beautiful mural in the street in Washington, DC. Yeah, that's great. But the activists moved in. And it was like, this ain't enough. This ain't what we asked you for. And we're not going to stop until we get it. So just get comfortable. I love it. I love it. These these young people are fearless and I love it. So to <laughs> that point, to that point, I want to ask you about this. Back to your to your uh your 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 runnings for the 2020. Mm -hmm. So a lot of a lot of performative politics that we're seeing right now. We're seeing 
something that I find extremely disrespectful is the kneeling, right? The knee, the police will Ooh. kneel. Uh, we have, we have Congress kneeling in kente cloth. It's like Lord. double downing on it. Right. Um, uh, we have the black lives matters murals painted in places where the mayors who are asking for these things to get painted. Actually we're increasing police budgets, building new jails, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have the bigger issue. Um, and I think this is part of your guys' platform too, which is military spending. Yeah. So as we look at law enforcement, to me, law enforcement is the local arm of, of, of the military, right? Look at the way they, they dress. And the, and the, uh, when I say dress, I mean with the Kevlar and the tanks. So $686.1 billion, I believe we spent, had a military budget of, uh, in 2019, uh, and we also had a, a bump to that budget that was a bipartisan approval in Congress. Mm -hmm. And we have a $7.5 billion budget for the CDC, which the Trump administration has tried on two different occasions to defund even more. Um, in the midst of this pandemic, or before this pandemic, uh, the Trump administration uh, got rid of the research facility that we had in China's CDC and he got rid of the kind of like the early warning system um, that we had in place during the Obama administration mm -hmm. for, for the pandemic response. What is, what is the, the green party's uh, take on this and what is the strategy? What is the green party's platform, I guess, on, on these issues around COVID relief? Co from COVID relief to military spending, I guess. Well, how is plan our plan as a platform is to cut seventy five percent, cut the military spending by seventy five percent, and of course reallocate those monies to programs that need to be funded that are good for people. Um, and thinking about COVID coming through COVID, and I'm pulling it up now so that I'm not like tripping over my tongue as I like to do because <laughs> I do gotcha. it all the time. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I want to make sure that I get this, you know, get it right. But Howie, you know, his, one of his by words or his by phrases right now is test, trace, and I think it's test, trace, and isolate. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as, you know, preventing the spread of COVID because it is, um, we're not done. People want to act like, you know, things are open and, you know, it's all good. And no, it's not. You know, we're seeing spikes in states like South Carolina that open too quickly. And so one of the things for the duration of the crisis is Medicare to pay for COVID-19 testing, treatment and all emergency health care. Uh, invoking the Defense Protection Act to rapidly plan the production and distribution of medical supplies and a universal test, contact, uh, contact trace, and quarantine program to safely reopen the economy. Because we are not, we're open and we're not safe. Um, mm -hmm. Establishing two thousand dollars a month uh, to keep folks afloat to all adults over age sixteen and five hundred per child. Uh, making loans to all businesses and hospitals to keep their payroll going and fixed overhead to be forgiven if all of the workers are kept on the payroll. So it's like a payroll uh, payroll protection program. Also, and this is relevant in Milwaukee, just because because uh, just bec uh, before you and I started talking, I pulled up mm -hmm. an article that said um, that the moratorium on evictions, I guess, in Milwaukee has been lifted and the they're at like 40% with evictions now or going ahead Ooh. with those proceedings. Yeah. It, you know, it. I didn't really get into it because I'm already not really happy and I don't need to be full on mm -hmm. depressed. But mm -hmm. yeah. It, and I, you know, you knew it was coming, and you, and just with it being Milwaukee and the book Evicted being centered in Milwaukee about evictions and the way that our housing, you know, housing crisis in Milwaukee is set up, I wasn't quite ready to handle that. So, <laughs> yeah, 
a more we would call a moratorium on evictions, foreclosures, and utility shutoffs through this crisis. So, and I think, um, you know, canceling rent, mortgage, and utility payments. The federal government pays those bills. High income people pay taxes on that relief. Suspending student loan programs with zero interest accumulation and then establishing federal universal rent control. Ooh. And also, yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> and people. I live in California, so that hits me close to home living here in California. I, hey, I mean, it's, it's, it's justice. Housing is a human right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you should not. Especially when, you know, I was, I don't know much about Oakland. You know, I've never been. I've got a lot of folks that, you know, have visited and, you know, friends that live there that love it. But thinking about the, um, I want to say it's Oakland Moms for Housing. Yeah. And taking yeah. those. You it's know, down the street from here. That's beautiful. I, I was, that like, hearing about, learning about them made my whole day. Where it was just like, you know, these houses are sitting here. This is a man-made crisis. And housing is a human right. If it's vacant, take it. And I think that that's, yeah, I'm here for that. But um, also um, a 10-year, $42 trillion eco-socialist Green New Deal for economic recovery. (laughs) Yes. Mm -hmm. Economic recovery through a just transition to 100% clean energy by 2030, because basically we are out of time on that. And then, of course, universal mail-in ballots for the 2020 general election, because you want to keep people safe. You don't want what we've seen in Wisconsin and in Georgia, where people are being exposed to something that could potentially kill them just to exercise their civic right to vote. So Okay, so... There was an article that came out in Business Insider today. Business mm-hmm. Insider is a pretty conservative publication, right? It's just talking about the flow of capital and rich people getting rich. Mm. Um, I get alerts from it. And there, here's the headline. Nursing homes reveal a $25 billion conundrum. No one wants to pay for the millions of coronavirus tests required to reopen the country. Uh, Nursing homes are particularly vulnerable to deadly coronavirus outbreaks because residents tend to be elderly. They have existing health conditions and can't stay six feet away from others. Mm -hmm. To protect residents, many states are requiring nursing homes to test workers regularly for the novel coronavirus. But testing is expensive and it's unclear who will foot this bill. Health insurers do not want to pay for ongoing testing. The challenges of paying for testing in nursing homes reveal how hard it'll be to reopen the U.S., Many are looking for more answers from the Trump administration. One study estimated that ongoing coronavirus testing nationwide would cost $25 billion a year. Um, In New York State, the epicenter of the outbreak, state officials required facilities to test their workers twice a week. That's 205,000 people taking 410,000 tests every seven days according to Stephen Hance, the CEO of the New York State Health Facilities Association. The cost? An estimated $40 million a week. Most private health insurers aren't footing the bill. Instead, facilities are risking bankruptcy and borrowing money to keep up. Before this started, 46% of skilled nursing facilities in the state were already in the red, according to Hansey. New York plans to decrease the testing requirements to once a week in most regions, the New York Post reported on Wednesday, but there's still no plan to pay for the testing. Lord. So I say that and I read this article because things like this, I want to bring out to people and kind of explain to them that this system that we're living in isn't working and these tepid reforms aren't going to help us out No, ripping up speeches and kneeling in your kente cloth and naming a street black lives Boulevard isn't going to help, especially when we have these public health issues that we are not funding because we would rather fund a drone war. Um, Yes. 
how do we how, how do we connect again I guess I guess I'm asking the question again how do we connect our people to this socialist movement I think we need to talk to them I think we need to be honest with them I remember run, when I ran in 2014, I ran as an independent socialist and people have been red baited so much that, you know, a lot of people shy away from any hint of socialism. You remember that was something that was constantly leveled at uh, President Obama, even though nothing could be further than the <laughs> truth. I wish he was a socialist. Lord, I was like, please. Y'all mm -hmm. don't know what a socialist is if you think this is what he is. Um, oh, yeah. And people just really shy away from it. And it was really interesting because in, like, the hood and telling people I was a socialist, it was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and that was it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nobody mm -hmm. freaked out. It was dope. It was like, oh, okay. So we can have this discussion then. You know, especially when you bring, you know, in communities, black communities, communities of color, you bring in the history of socialist organizations like the Panthers, like the Young Lords, you know, like, you know, folks in the Mexico movement, people that, you know, the Chicano, movement, people on the ground, people that, you know, got things done mm -hmm. and took care of the people, made sure, you know, the you know, making sure the kids eat breakfast, making sure people are getting tested for TB, um, picking the garbage up, things that people can see. And so bringing that in makes us a lot less scary to people. And it also reminds our people, we got, we've been doing this. We, this ain't new. And, and what we're talking about, this is stuff we've advocated for decades. I mean, one of the things that was really dope to hear how we say was like, you know, we are, you know, the, the best way to address what's happening in black communities is building black power. I'm like, yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's why I'm here right here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not to, and not shying away from that and, and drawing from that history, particularly for black people, that this is, you know, the, the Panther platform was explicitly socialist, explicitly before, even before the Panthers, a lot of stuff coming out of, you know, the black is beautiful and, and, and things like that. Those things, those demands were socialist and our people were making connections between the oppression of black people within these borders and the oppression of people of color around the world and um, building solidarity internationally, which I think we're seeing, you know, you've got folks in Japan rising up. You've got folks, you know, excuse me, in Palestine sending messages of support as they've always done um, to Black Lives Matter and, and vice versa. And so I think in the best way to get this into the hands of, of working folks in our communities is simply to have discussions and not bite our tongues about who we are. Like I am a socialist <laughs> and, you know, start that discussion because, you know, we've been programmed so many of us to think only in terms of Democrat and Republican. It's very frustrating to watch our people just like beating their heads against a wall, feeling like they don't have any choices politically. And we do. We have a lot of leverage. If we are not afraid to use it, we could flip this government. And what would that be? Lord have mercy. That'd be that that'd be beyond my wildest dreams. But we could. So here's a I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Here's another question for you, and it definitely gets into more in a class. And I don't know if you if you listen to or, or read uh, Adolph Reed Jr., who wrote class notes in the early 2000s, um, to to the discussion about uh, black people and black power. Mm -hmm. How do we differentiate black power from black capitalism? 
Fred, Chairman Fred said it perfectly. We are not going to fight capitalism with black capitalism. We're going to fight it with socialism. Um, there is a very pervasive belief that, first off, we have to get people educated in exactly what these two systems are and how capitalism has harmed our people by making a commodity out of everything at one time that commodity was us and if you are incarcerated that commodity is still us mm -hmm. um and i think people have a very murky understanding of capitalism and living in a capitalist country you know that's been the ideal that's held up in front of us is that you want things you know Success is measured in the things you acquire and, you know, mm -hmm. get yours. You better get yours. You know, you don't get yours and, you know, you're 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 somehow valued less because of what you don't have. And I think we're going to have to challenge that narrative. And I think with our young people, they are already on that. They get it. You know, they know that the attainment of you know, degrees and the attainment of the material things that, you know, my generation was taught we're supposed to want. They, they're not about that life. A lot of young mm -hmm. people. I mean, you know, a lot of them do. They buy into the, you know, the bling. And I don't even think people say that no more. I showed you how old I am. But drip, is it? I would. You know, the drip. Is, I think it's drip. Is it the drip? The young ones say, is it the drip? I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's not for me to know. I'm 40. I'll be 43 this year. It's not for me to know. And I'm 46. And I'm just like, I guess, you know, my daughter is 27. So I get like some of the stuff, but it's like, mm -hmm. I, I get confused. But <laughs> like, they're not buying it. My daughter, you know, being 27, to hear her like call out cishet patriarchy, I'm like, look at my kid. <laughs> like, in those terms and like breaking it down, I was like, Look at my baby. It's just, you know, and, and he's, it's amazing. And and I don't think, I think the only folks that will be super resistant to our message are our older ones. Because that thinking of capitalism as success is ingrained in a lot of our older people especially those who have attained some measure of success underneath it you know what i'm saying mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's hard to break like you can't you know you you calling for a universal basic income for all people is not that's not the move why why does everybody have to you know everybody can't physically work you know mm -hmm. Why can't we open up a space where people can do whatever it is they are able to do to contribute without the push of capitalism hanging over them? It's well, also, also the way we view labor, too, you know? Yes. Like, we don't look at the housewife as labor. Yes. And when Care we don't work look at the... Not valued. No, not at all. Oh, you, oh, I stay home and take care of my sick mother. Oh, well, that's just you. You're just a lazy person. It's like, no, that's labor. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And and it shows. Like going back to what you said earlier, what you were talking about with nursing homes, it just hit me in the heart because it's not only the frail people who are who are confined in those spaces, but also who's the who are the people caring for them? Yep. They're primarily black, brown, and female. My daughter is a CNA. So is my sister. Mm -hmm. And so when you were reading that, it just kind of, you know, hit me in my chest because what this government is basically saying is that not only are those folks confined in those spaces expendable, but so are those people caring for them. Mm -hmm. When is it enough? When is it too much? When do we, when is it us saying our people are not expendable? We're not collateral damage. You don't get to, you don't get to play this game with us. And I think that we're at that moment. And I'm, I hope so. I'm grateful for it. I hope so. Is there anything you would like to 
promote, say, any upcoming engagements you have you want to shout out or anything? You know, Howie and I do a um, a Q and A on YouTube and Facebook Live uh, every Tuesday night. I want to say it starts at eight. Is Ask Howie and Angela, and um, folks that want to join us for that, we'd love to have you and bring your questions. And was there anything that you wanted to know that I did not answer? Cause I, I so, tend to go around the world with stuff. So <laughs> no, no, we we were hey, we were just talking. So I did ask some friends of mine on social media. Um, is there any questions you would like to ask Angela Walker mm-hmm. and my good friend Josh Stelling from Billings, Montana? He's part of the DSA in Billings. Okay. He said, "How do we start to change the national narrative on foreign policy?" As far as war. And I said, well, can you specify? Yes. <laughs> can you specify? And he said, as far as warfare. And the U.S. is at war currently with seven countries. Niger, Afghanistan. Oh, God. We're the Somalia. And n- none of these things get talked about. Right. The, the seven countries that we are literally fighting a war with. Um, I guess his question is, how do we how do we change the way the U.S. looks at foreign policy, especially when it comes to what is it, 800 plus military bases in over 100 countries around the world? Well, in our platform, we're very explicit in the endless wars and bring the troops home. And as I mentioned before, you want to cut the military budget by 75%. Bring our people home. Bring that money home. Bring those resources home. And then start doing the work, um, investing those savings in a global Green New Deal and use diplomacy and international law to actively promote peace, human rights, and democracy. We have a lot of amends to make around the world. There's a lot of damage that U.S. imperialism has caused around the world. And so... We have to have people in those positions of power that understand that, that understand that we have not been, we have not been a good neighbor on this planet. (laughs) We have not been, and that, I know that's like the understatement of like three centuries, but. Ask Mexico. (laughs) Just Mexico alone. Nicaragua, uh, Venezuela, Cuba. (laughs) I mean. Pick somebody. Nobody mm-hmm. likes us. Why should they? <laughs> you know, exactly. we we have we have not been kind. We have not been good neighbors, and we need people. You know, your friend is asking, how do we start reshaping the way that we handle foreign policy? You have to have people in positions that are making foreign policy that actually care about the rest of the world and how we interact with them. And not seeing coming from this place of rugged American individualism and domination. Mm -hmm. And we're going to basically take your resources, which is what these wars are about anyway. Yeah, control all resources. Yeah. You've got it. I want it. I've got the bigger things to beat you in the head with. And I'm going to take it. Is, Is the schoolyard bully on a macro level? (laughs) <laughs> it is it's, I mean if you that's, that's how I look at it it's like the, the mm-hmm. kid in the sandbox that that's bigger than all other little kids and is a bully that's us and then we wonder why people don't like us so mm-hmm. I think you know the very first thing is making sure that the people who are in positions at the highest level of government that have position that have the ability to shape foreign policy that they are coming from a mindset of peace and of reconciliation and of reparation and that they understand that we need to bring occupying troops home back to the United States and reinvest the monies that are going out into these endless wars, reinvest that money in 
uh, rebuilding the infrastructure of this country and supporting people and supporting the planet. Well, I think that's a very fair answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put a link to your, your Q and a uh, YouTube channel on the show. I did actually see a quick Q and a, and I forgot to bring it up. How we had mentioned it was, it was about police reform. Mm -hmm. It was pretty recent. Was that the last one you did last week? Yes. And he mentioned the city I grew up in, Richmond, California. Yes. He talks about uh, Richmond a lot. Is he from California? I don't think so. I don't think so. But there's a model of community-based policing that mm -hmm. he cites that Richmond under a police chief you know, she's gone now. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. And he holds that up as a model of, of how this can work because a lot of people tend to think that this is some aspirational idea and it's really not. This is very doable and it is tweakable to whatever commute, you know, whatever the community it's in decides that it needs to be. It's not and, a one and, size fit all. And Richmond, it was a small city, but it was a very, is a very violent city. Mm -hmm. Very, very violent. So those changes that that police chief made, the, 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 to look at a violent city and not say the boot needs to be harder on the necks of the poor, but we need to change the way that we look at how we handle this was was pretty cool to be say hey that's my city oh that's dope um, but that chief is gone and <laughs> uh oh richmond's definitely having some issues <sighs> but that'll be part of a talk for another time uh a angela walker vp candidate for the green party thank you so much for taking the time to holler at me today i hope that you can come back and we can talk about more stuff. Is that a possibility? Of course. Okay. I'm going to play some music. Please don't hang up. Dictator in chief orders his back.